the Dauntless. There was a pause as all of them leave the elevator. The two gigantic women in power armor are nearly scraping against the ceiling and bristling with weapons. The cultural pattern of the armor being a base color but repainted to match the blood splatters of their victims lets him know that the one on the left has literally waded through blood and probably killed more than a few people with her hands. The other has an almost mist-like effect over her own and a huge splash over the chest. She's kept her hands clean but is just as blood-soaked as the other. I have here a warrant for the arrest of Mallory Mixus. Stand aside. Linda orders and there's outright scoffing from the two power-armored women. Linda audibly swallows in fear before squaring herself and marching forward. Hold on, I have a cunning plan, Operative Jameson says, stepping around them and walking up to the two massive women carrying weapons bigger than he is and towering over him like titans. Hello, ladies. I'm going to make you two move. And how do you intend to do that tiny? I could fit my cannon's muzzle over your head. The crimson hue are on the right states and Jameson chuckles. A good squeeze around the shoulders and we could stuff his whole body in it. The one on the left notes as she cracks her knuckles through the armor. Do you know what day and time it is? He asks and both pause. I'm not asking about the galactic date. I'm asking about the human calendar. Clearly, neither woman expected anything like this. Why would we know something like that? Big T Tuesday, Barnabas asks, and Jameson turns to point at him. A speciality night on the Dauntless with themed foods. Tequila, tacos, tlacoyos, and just about anything that you can eat wrapped in a tortilla. Jameson explains, and both mercenaries are now off guard and confused. If ever there was a time to attack, it's now. Why are you talking about this? Well, you see, I know your names and faces, Miss Zia Bitesome and Miss Barry Clawgore. I have told your names and given your faces to the guards on the Dauntless. You have two hours to get to the ship, and if you arrive in that time, both of you and two of your friends, each, will be allowed in and not required to pay for anything in the cafeteria meaning you will enjoy a bottomless tab in the middle of manland, in the middle of a party where the men will grow more and more uninhibited and daring as the hours pass. But if you want to get there in time, you have to go now. This is a trick, the one on the right says. I'm married, says the crimson hewer on the left. It's a trick called a bribe, so yes. Jameson replies to the crimson hewer on the right before turning to his left. You may be married, Madam Clawgore, but your daughters are not. Who better to help them catch a man each than their mother making sure they not only don't make mistakes, but making sure she has many pictures for future blackmail? Pardon memories. Yes, memories. How do we know this is real? That this offer actually exists? Madam, there are few things stupider than offering bribes you can't pay. Word quickly gets around that your word is worthless and you forever lose the ability to bribe people, even if you have the bribe on hand. Only an imbecile introduces treachery where it's not needed. No, there's no need for me to sour or salt the pot. I've offered a prize sweet enough that if I opened a fight pit for the pleasure, I would have a stack of dead bodies and a pair of winners within the day. But if you two would rather fight than fuck, who am I to deny you? All right, smart boy. We've called in our replacements. They'll be here shortly, Zia Bitesum says with a smug tone. But if you two don't start running now, you might not make it in time. You don't have the time to wait for your relief. You need to abandon your post. Jameson replies and both Crimson Hewers glance at each other. You are a devious little bastard. It's said so lowly that either woman could have muttered it, but the whole room catches the awed insult regardless. I'll pass your compliments on to my teacher, Jameson replies, and both mercenary women look to each other, clearly speaking through their in-armor comms and debating. Then they step to the side and the group is allowed to pass, even as the crimson hewers rush for the stairs down. Clearly, they think the elevators are too slow. Goddamn man, they really called it. You are a devious little bastard, 
Barnabas says with a chuckle, and Jameson offers him a grin. Spend as much time and intelligence as I do, and you'll become just as big a pain in the ass. Jameson jokes even as Officer Linda Score opens the doors to the office of Mallory Mixus. There's a pause as the Angla woman stares at them, her glowing antenna first the red of fear before glowing stark white in rage. And where the hell are my guards? Who are you people, and what makes you lunatics think you can just march into my office? Mallory Mixus demands them, and Linda holds up her badge. Mallory Mixus? You're under arrest. What for? She says, looking to each and every one of them. Her eyes flicker back to silent as to make sure he's actually there. Possession of a kiloton of high-powered chemical-based explosives within a civilian area without proper security. Having an armed bomb primed and ready in a civilian area without proper warning or indications of danger recognizable by galactic citizens. For the misuse of a centrist spire to produce incredibly dangerous weapons for the express purpose of causing untold and unwarranted damages to... That's enough! A voice suddenly echoes from every device in the room that isn't in the possession of someone. A silver-skinned fishwoman shouldn't be able to go pale in fear, but damn if she doesn't, her natural sheen takes on a sickly pallor as she shakes, and her antenna starts glowing red for fear rather than white for wrath. Lady Knight, I swear, this is just a minor setback. No, no it is not. You have failed, Mallory. You have failed completely and totally. We are done with you. The voice states, No! No! You bitch! Do you have any idea what you've cost me? Mallory screams, standing upright her antenna, now glowing a white so bright that they're forced to squint at the sheer light of it. I'll kill you myself! The antenna lets out an ungodly flash, blinding everyone looking at her. There's a thump as Barnabas hits the floor and drags down everyone to dodge what's no doubt the first attack of many. The sizzling tang of plasma fills the air, and there's a growling roar and the crunching of metal. The room shifts beneath them as their eyes clear and the floor suddenly vanishes to dump them into an area brimming with axiom. They're in an expanded space where a small cavity has been grown into a large cavern. Most land badly, including Barnabas as his ankle twists so hard that for a moment he would swear it's broken. He stands regardless and helps up the injured Linda. That is a mobile artillery barrage-class combat walker. It was rumored she might have one, but there was nothing confirmed, Jameson says as he pulls out a device. There's an enormous roar, and Vera, no longer even remotely humanoid anymore, slams into the side of the walker and sinks her three-foot-long teeth into the left arm. Her enormous fangs shear through the metal and plastic without resistance, and the enormous plasma cannon erupts in fire, which causes her to jump back and away with a pained and furious roar. Then the gigantic beast, easily big enough to ride on, dodges a blast of plasma from the unmangled gun, even as the damaged gun arm starts to glow and pull itself together. The mech walker is repairing itself. Then there's a burst of light as Jameson reveals that his device is a flashbang that he cooked so that it would go off right in front of the walker sensors. That won't work too many times, Jameson notes as he unveils a shotgun from the recesses of his coat. We need to change the game, Barnabas says, loading a brown shell into the caster gun. Everyone brace! The gun erupts in visible energy patterns before unleashing a deep brown shot that then slams into the floor between them and the walker. Gravity alters its orientation and they begin skidding down the floor which has become a wall and land fairly well on the wall of the chamber which is now a floor. The walker slams into the wall and struggles to right itself, something it cannot do before Vera is on it again and savaging its armor with claw and fang. Silent, Barnabas and Jameson all rush towards the walker along different routes. Silence and Barnabas start rushing along the walls, making use of the adjusted gravity to keep moving. 
Jameson simply goes up the floor, turned wall with nearly expert axiom control, and slams several shotgun slugs into delicate sensor equipment. Equipment that starts to pull itself back together, but entangles the physical slugs and keeps the walker, if not blind, then at least somewhat disoriented. Silence rushes along the wall, gathering a smoke grenade and priming the charge before letting it fly to further baffle the sensors of the walker and give Vera more time to maul the mechanized monster. As the Takra tears chunks out of walker while screaming and yowling in rage, Barnabas, cursing under his breath as he runs on a twisted ankle, loads a light blue shell into his caster. As Mallory gets her walker back on its feet and wards away Vera with a spray of fire from her now-repaired plasma cannon, Barnabas fires the shot and the area is suddenly covered in steel-hard ice. This only buys some breathing room as ignited plasma is the same stuff of stars, and when it comes between the ice of a comet VS, the fire of a star, the star always wins. It does buy them several seconds as the walker is forced to overload its plasma cannons to melt its way out and the steam completely baffles its sensors. At this point, Vera, in her feral state, comes up with her own personal cunning plan or lust-filled fantasy and rushes around towards Barnabas. With a gentle lick that damn near rips off his face, she nuzzles him until he gets the picture and climbs onto her back. Rider in place, Vera charges directly at the walker as Barnabas channels Axiom to two purposes. First is a trick he had been taught about the brand on his shoulder. It begins to glow brightly, visible even through his clothing, and then the glow spreads over not only him and his clothing, but over Vera as well. The second is so that he stays on her back without being thrown off by the sheer movement. His timing is good as a blast of plasma slams into Vera's face, but with a triumphant roar, she charges clean through the heat of a star, even as Barnabas starts to load his next caster shot. Dark Blue enters the chamber, and as Vera leaps for the walker, he takes aim and unleashes the plasma bombardment right down the barrel of one of the plasma cannons. While a plasma cannon is designed to resist plasma, that resistance is highest before the gun goes off and only accounts for plasma going one way. His shot causes it to straight up detonate and throws the walker completely off balance just in time for Vera to slam into it and begin savaging its legs. As this is happening, Silence and Jameson land on top of the walker. Silence goes to blind the self-repairing machine and keep it blind as Jameson starts to pry it open to get at the meaty bits inside. There is a scream of utter terror as he finally succeeds and yanks the struggling Mallory out by the back of her dress. She lands hard and looks up to find herself staring down the barrel of a shock pistol. You are under arrest, Linda growls out and Mallory lets her head hit the ground in defeat. Officer Score, are you all right? A voice asks from the entrance to the pit. What took you so long? Linda calls up. It's been less than two minutes. Oh, a lot happened in those two minutes. I can see that. Do you need reinforcements? No, but some vehicles to not only get U.S. out of here, but her as well would be appreciated. Linda replies. Excuse me, what's the current policy on looting? This walker is incredible. The thing has damn near completely repaired itself already. Hey, it's still mine. Mallory protests before shrinking back under the glare of Linda's shock pistol. The criminal is right. The walker, while about to be confiscated, is still her legal possession and we can't just let you run off with it. So hopefully at the next police auction we'll be able to walk away with this beast, Jameson says with a huge smile. Speaking of beasts, you did great big girl. Can you change back now? I don't think I'll survive another lick. Barnabas notes as he stands beside the still transformed Vera, who's cuddling into him and purring like big rig motor, that her head is the size of his chest and her gigantic fangs or the length of his arms is nothing short of fucking terrifying. To say nothing of the snow white pelt with pale brown stripes. This cat comes from cold climes and will kill you dead in them. 
Having trouble? Jameson asks with a grin. Not really, he says, as he rubs her behind the ears. I know it feels good, but how can I kiss you if you don't have proper lips? The moment he asks his question, the enormous cat starts to shift, and in moments he has Vera's tanned arms wrapped around the back of his neck as she locks her lips with his and purrs in pleasure. You know how to sweet-talk a girl now, don't you, big man? She asks after finishing the kiss.